Well, good morning. It is great having you participating in the service today, whether you're here in the room or watching out in the atrium or watching from home. It's awesome to have you with us. And hopefully that woke you up this morning. We're in a brand new series called Breakthrough. And we began last week, we had our creative team write an original story. And it's a story of a man who's trying to have a breakthrough in all of the challenges of pressures of, of work life and family life. And so we've been doing what's called Reader's Theater. If you've never seen Reader's Theater before, it's a group of actors who are acting out a story by telling it, reading it to you in a dramatic way. So last week we got introduced to a guy named Murphy. And Murphy is trying to find more than just, more than just okay. More than just, how you doing? I'm doing fine. He's climbing the corporate ladder. He's doing quite well. But there's a sense of dissatisfaction and a sense that time is a predator who is always breathing down his back. So today as we pick up the story, I think we're going to pick up on a longing we all have. How do you live the best kind of life? How do you infuse life with significance as often as possible? And how do you genuinely say to people when they ask, how you doing? Not just fine, but something deeper than that. Something more significant than that. So thanks for joining us today as we delve into the second chapter of Breakthrough.
In part one of Breakthrough, we met Alan Murphy, a top executive of Mandel Industries. His success has lifted him to the top of his profession, but a poor quarterly report has the volatile chairman of the board breathing down Murphy's neck. Tensions are also growing at home. Murphy's demanding schedule leaves him little time to be there for his wife, Audrey, and their kids. His only mental reprieve is the time he spends tending to an aquarium filled with tropical fish and a small figurine of a scuba diver who Murphy imagines is living a better life than he is. As we catch up with Murphy, he's arriving at the airport for an early morning flight. He's traveling to a meeting with Icon, a crucial client who's evaluating the terms of a new proposal. After a series of near misses with other prospects, Murphy needs a win. The company's future depends on it. TSA pre-check to the left, all others to the right. Keep the line moving. The TSA agent turns her attention to Murphy. Sir, please, dispose of your coffee before you get in line. Oh, right. Sorry about that. Murphy takes a big swig of coffee. He's suddenly bumped into by an energetic couple. Tan and happy, dressed in casual beach wear, Murphy's coffee spills down his tie. The woman excitedly talks on the phone. They don't notice the collision. Oh, we loved it so much. We're moving there. <laughs> <laughs> well, th th tell, her, tell her we found a house right on the beach. Yes, right on the beach. Well, Ben and I are already working from home, so we figured, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Murphy steps aside, scrubbing the coffee stain from his tie. He feels the sting of his stomach ulcer and calculates if he'll have enough time to buy some antacids from the airport store. It's going to be tight. He gets to the other side of the TSA. Murphy checks the departure board for his flight. It's not there. He stops a passing agent. Oh, excuse me. Um, I'm looking for Sky Blue Flight 304. It's supposed to be leaving at 710. Sky Blue? Oh, they're in Terminal B now. You're in Terminal A. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Okay, thanks. Murphy sprints to the exit and barely catches the shuttle. The van is packed. He squeezes in on a bench beside an elderly man who's sniffling. Don't worry. I, I don't have a cold. Excuse me? The sniffles. I, I, I just wanted you to know I'm not contagious. It's not a cold or anything. To be honest, I've been crying. Oh, um, it's okay. Murphy isn't sure what to do with this information. We just buried my best friend, Fred Banner. Rest in peace. <laughs> Grew up together. I've never known a better guy than Fred. <laughs> A man of his word. He'd give you the shirt off his back. Scratch golfer, too. <laughs> Every drive straight down the fairway. Every drive. Wow. That is something. Always said we were going to play golf together at Pebble Beach. But Fred dropped dead of a heart attack. Nobody saw it coming. Oh, I'm so sorry. Pebble Beach. What's your name? Oh, uh, Alan Murphy. Mm -hmm. People call me Murph. Bob Bannister. Nice to meet you, Murph. Let me give you some advice. Don't put off to tomorrow what you can do today. Clock's ticking. Um, uh, it's nice to meet you, Bob. I, I've, I've got to go catch my flight. Mm. Hang in there. Mm. The shuttle stops and passengers scurry off. Bob begins to cry again. Murphy gathers his luggage and gives the stranger an awkward pat on the shoulder. He lingers for a moment, unsure how to proceed. Murphy dashes through the terminal, Bob's words ringing in his ears. Don't put off to tomorrow what you can do today. He moves through TSA without incident and spies his gate in the distance. Another glance at his watch. 7.05. The doors will be closing any second, Murphy's light jog turns into an all-out sprint as he zeroes in on the check-in desk up ahead. Hold that flight! Hold that flight! I'm Alan Murphy! I'm here! I'm here! Murphy skids up to the desk, panting heavily. I'm Alan Murphy, seat 9B. 
I really need to get on that flight. Is it too late to board? Oh, don't worry. Didn't you hear the announcement? Our flight's been delayed three hours. She sweeps her arms toward the mass of travelers lounging in chairs all around them. Relax, Mr. Murphy. You have all the time in the world. His stomach ulcer elicits a sharp twinge. Oh, I need to get some antacids. Murphy walks to a nearby shop. He dials his assistant, hoping she can book a sooner flight. No answer. He leaves a voicemail and turns his attention back to his aching belly. He grabs some Rolaids from the shelf and notices a headache coming on, too. He adds a bottle of Tylenol and sets the goods on the counter. As the clerk scans Murph's purchases, he hears a phrase echoing in his head. Clock's ticking. So our story will continue over the next couple of weeks, but I think we can all identify with rushing to the airport, and then all of a sudden you got plenty of the time, and, and this kind of sense that, that Murphy just feels frantically controlled by the clock. We all know that feeling. We all know the feeling of deadlines and tomorrow haunting at us. But what is it? Is, is there any way in which, like we saw the first week, looking into that, that aquarium, is there another way to live? Is there another way to perceive the times and deadlines around us? And how do we bring that perspective, if there is one, into our real life, our real deadlines, and our real sense of what needs to get done each day? And that phrase, don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. That is an incredible piece of advice that many of us have taken. And some of us have wondered, what does that even mean anyway? Other times, that very phrase can be the haunting, the, the haunting root of all of our problems. We don't want to put it off till tomorrow, so we're trying to cram it all in today. Do more today. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. And that's actually driving the very problem we have. How can our perception of tomorrow and time free us to see and do things differently? See, tomorrow can can make us race against time with always a sense of urgency is dissatisfaction. Or tomorrow can make us prioritize the time we have. Now, both people are going to be productive. Someone who races against time and someone who prioritizes the time they have. There's actually a difference between those two views of tomorrow. One of which creates a sense of unhealthy urgency in our life, all the time, never relaxing, never sharpening. Another one allows us to prioritize, and there is a time to get stuff done. There's a time and seasons of life that sometimes you just got to go the extra mile or two. But then there's also a sense of time that if I keep doing that all the time and never have time for rest and never have time to recharge, I'm actually going to be less productive because I haven't sharpened my axe. So I want to look today at those two aspects of tomorrow. What it means to race against time versus what it means to prioritize the time we have. So when you're racing against time, you always feel that tomorrow has got you pressed for time. Time has been compressed and pressurized. And, and, and so you're, you enjoy work. I love work. I love to work. But what's the difference between work and overworking because you you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Some of us love to produce, but what does it mean to overproduce? Is that even a thing? And, and what does it mean that we so love to work and so love to produce that we become addicted to producing so much so we don't know how to relax? We don't know how to not produce. We don't know who we are if we don't produce. It's a guy named Paul who's giving some kind of ancient wisdom that's applied to all people in all times about how we perceive tomorrow. And you might think, well, some Bible guy, what does he know about the common pressures of life? This guy so packed his schedule that he was able to be so impactful to individual people and so impactful to the world that everything you know today about the Western world comes from how this guy managed his time. And yet he offered a different view of time. Thought him to make a huge difference but also to perceive time differently. 
His name was the Apostle Paul, a leader in the early church. He's writing to a group of people in Corinth called the Corinthians in a little letter called the first book to Corinthians. Just a letter he's written to them about how to make the best out of life. Unless we think an ancient book written to ancient people has no wisdom for modern people in modern times, let me give you a sense of exactly what was going on in Corinth. This was a place of commerce. This was a place of merchants. This was a place of business, an incredible metropolis of success. Let me take you to Corinth. Where in the world is Corinth? Corinth is in Europe meets Greece, Greece area, that area of the country. And Corinth is this little bitty city here just on a peninsula. And what made them so strategic is this particular city had both a western ocean coming in and an eastern ocean coming in, and they were the city that brought commerce from both sides. Now, this city was so impactful that it was a major metropolis. It was a classic Greek-Roman city. It had the gymnasiums. Let me show you. The gymnasiums. It had theaters. It had a huge marketplace for businesses all over the countryside came to do business here in this place. It had an agora, public officials. This was a world-class city of Corinth. However, it was also a spiritual city, a spiritual city that followed uh, the Greek gods, in fact, they were right next to this beautiful mountain. This particular mountain, there was a temple there who worshipped Poseidon's wife. So you've heard of Zeus or Hades and Demeter. Well, Zeus had a brother named Poseidon, the god of the seas. Well, they worshipped his, his wife there. In fact, the two ports were named after Poseidon's two sons to his wife. And that's up at the mountaintop, but just at the base of this was where Corinth was. And Corinth, while you were doing business and making money and merchants were flocking here because of so much opportunity, there was a gigantic temple to Apollo, the god of light, that you thanked for giving the opportunities to do your work. These were business people. These were spiritual people. And yet also there is a particular person who served here that was managing all of the business and all of the work and all of the progress. And this city was massive. It's got protective walls. It's got city buildings. Let me show you. Here's just some of the protective walls that would protect them from attack. Here are some of the just city emporiums. We still have the rubble today of that. I mean, this was a monstrous city. And the city manager of all of this was a Christian. His name was Erastus. We know that because they actually have his name on a, a, a block of stone that he was the city treasure still there to this day. And he's not a follower of Zeus or Hades or Apollo. He was a follower of Jesus. And he brought some sense of how the Bible describes and perceives time to how he managed the city. The Bible mentions him three times. I've compressed him here. Erastus, the treasure of the city. I mean, that's a CFO of a monstrous metropolis. He greets you, and Quartus, a brother, another verse in the Bible. So he sent into Macedonia, that's this area we're in here in Greece, two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus. He's a major um, leader in the early church movement. And Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus and I left in Miletus 6. So he's kind of giving an update to people in these three passages. This guy who has a different view of time, is able to be very, very successful, but he's learned something the Bible says about tomorrow and time that helps him perceive that. One more thing about Corinth. So go back to Corinth again, and you'll notice, let me step on this side, you'll notice that, again, there's a western sea and an eastern sea. They created a road here to do business so people didn't have to, have, have to sail all the way around to get there, like the Panama Canal today. Let me show you what that looked like. If you came in sailing from one side, you could pull your boat up here. Instead of sailing all the way around, you could pay someone to take your supplies straight over and sell at the port. Very, very efficient, very great business opportunity. If you had a small or medium-sized boat, you could hire people to drag that boat on wheels, and they would drag it all the way across from the eastern port to the western port. Pretty smart. Hadrian, one of the Roman emperors of the day, he thought it would be great to carve a, a channel here so boats could just go all the way through and save that time, save that money, and create more business opportunity. He started it, but unfortunately, there wasn't quite the technology to accomplish it. 
Not so much today. What, what Hadrian attempted to do is now known as the Corinth Canal today, where boats, sure enough, can travel from the east side to the west side. So I say all that to say, this is a very successful place with very successful business people doing very successful things. And it's into that that Paul writes. And he says, there's a view of tomorrow that will make you pressed for time. There's a view of tomorrow that will make you pressed of time. And he's going to somehow say that Jesus and Jesus' resurrection can help you in business. Really? Here's what he says. Now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. If the dead do not rise, then hey, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. What would this have to do with anyone's life? What he's saying is, we always hoped there was an eternity. We hoped there was more time. We hoped this life wasn't all there is. But now we know, we have seen a person, like there's people living who witnessed it. God came into our time, temporal time, from eternal time, and he died, and we thought, well, maybe that's it. How do you live your life if that's it? But we know that we saw someone die and raise himself from the dead, and because of that, because he's risen from the dead, he was the first fruit, like the first, and he promised there'll be more if you, if you go with him, of those who've fallen asleep. That's another idiom for dying. But if the dead do not rise, if there is no tomorrow, if this time is all you have, the short little dash between your birth date and your death date, if, if tomorrow's it, then your perception of time is going to be, well, I guess this is all there is. I'm pressed for time. I better cram it all in. I better shove it all in. I guess if this life is all there is, well, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. See, if this life is all there is, if you're not promised not just tomorrow but in eternity of time, we're going to feel pressed for time because we are. If this life is all there is, if there is no resurrection or eternity, you better never waste time. You better never waste time because it's very, very limited. No time to waste. Go, go, go. If this life is all there is, we race against time to do it all and to do it all now and to fit it all in. And the best we can do if we are going to die after 70, 90 years, we can live for, for pleasure. As he says, you eat and drink for tomorrow we die. I just got to get the most amount of pleasure and the least amount of pain. I'm going to live for that, for the moment, for legacy. Maybe I'll live to be remembered. And yet think of Erastus. He controlled one of the most major New York, Chicago cities in the world, and have you ever heard of him before today? So even if you live for legacy, what are you going to get? A hundred years of people remembering your name? And then you're just a plaque or a rock somewhere on some place that used to be famous? See, if this life is all there is, we can maximize pleasure and minimize pain in the time we have. But my point is I'm not going to be able to teach you today how to manage your time better. I'm going to teach you a way of thinking about time that might be driving you and not even realize it. If, if tomorrow is all you have, you're always going to be racing against the clock. Let me give you three examples of people who felt that view of time. Yeah, this is a motley crew. Like, who would you put these three people together? But all three apply to this. Frederick Nietzsche, Alice Cooper, and Oscar Wilde. Frederick Nietzsche said, there's no God, there's no eternity. Where is God we've killed in his poem, The Madman? But as he got older, he began to think to himself, what really matters? What can really have meaning if there's no eternity, if you live good or live bad, you end up the same way. There's no real benefit to being good. There's no real benefit to being bad. Well, that makes it better for society. Why do I care about society? They're going to be dead soon too. He started thinking about the ramifications of his worldview, of believing this is all there is. And a combination of medical issues and, I would say, philosophical issues, he began to logically think through his view of time and eternity and he started to lose his mind. And do you know who took care of him during those last few years where Frederick Nietzsche lost his mind, thinking everything was meaningless because he taught everything was meaningless? His Christian mom. His Christian mom cared for him because she had a different view of time. 
And when you care for people, God notices. And you care for people now, and it turns you into a caring person that's going to last forever. Oscar Wilde, if you don't know much about Oscar Wilde, he was a, 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 a man committed to the arts and decadence. And he said he, he didn't keep himself from any type of pleasure. He thought, I'm just going to live for pleasure today. There is no God. There is no eternity. I'm just going to live for pleasure. And he found it utterly meaningless. And let me give you a quote from his journal. He said, I desperately went to the depths to find new sensations of pleasure. And I kept finding a paradox. I was increasingly careless of other people. See, it pleased me to use people to bring me pleasure, but then I just passed them on. I forgot that my writing is so terrible, I should have written this better. <laughs> I forgot like every action let me try this one more time. That every action is a chain of events that either makes or unmakes my character. Every chain, every moment of the day either makes or unmakes my character. Hmm, that's a little different view. He says, the things that are done in the secret chambers of your life will someday cry out on the housetop. I ceased to be lord over myself, no longer captain of my own soul. Pleasure dominated me. And I found myself in horrible disgrace. What he said is, even the people I was having these, these sexual sensations with, I didn't even care about them. They were just objects used to make me better, and it made even the pleasure hollow over time. Living for pleasure, living for people, I didn't even feel like I was now in control of my own life. Something else out there was controlling me. For him, it was pleasure. For some, it's productivity. For some, it's work. Something has been the very thing you're living for. How about Alice Cooper? Believe it or not, Alice Cooper has talked, you can get on YouTube and watch it anywhere, he's talked incredibly about his faith in Jesus Christ. When he was a rock and roller, he said, I knew I had a lot I need to be forgiven of. He said, but what definitely scared me was becoming part of the 27 Club all my famous friends who committed suicide before age 27. And somebody introduced me to God and introduced me to Jesus. I realized I could be forgiven. And even the things I'd done wrong, I could have a longer life, an eternal kind of life. That I would one day die, my mortal body would die, but I could know of a resurrection, new type of life, and I could start living that eternal life now in how I began to look at my life and how I began to find meaning in my whole life changed in my view of eternity and my view of God. So what's the other view? Well, Paul says, well, there's one view that tomorrow's going to make you race against the time, feel pressed for time, but there's another way that time can allow you to prioritize what you have. Like Drew said last week, you don't get any more chronos, but you can make kairos. How, how, do, you, how do you make opportunities out of the time you have? That's the idea Paul's getting at here in Corinthians. He said, guys, first of all, you need to realize you've been deceived by a view of time. That view of time that this is all you have, that's actually what's causing the anxiety. That's causing that pressure. Here's how he says it. Do not be deceived, thinking that tomorrow's all there is. Therefore, let's eat and drink and tomorrow we die. Don't be deceived by that. Don't be fooled by that. That very idea is going to drive behaviors and habits that corrupt you, he says. There's going to be some good habits that get corrupted just because your view of tomorrow and time. Now, what would that look like practically? Well, have you ever played a board game? I mean, I love board games, but maybe you're not a big board game player, but you play Monopoly as a kid, you play with your kids and your grandkids. You ever played with that guy or that gal who takes the game way too seriously? I mean, like, I like to compete and I like to win, but they live like this game is their life. And when they're losing, they're really bad losers. I can't believe that's not fair. That's not what we said we we're going to do. Oh, come on. And when they're winning, oh, they just stick it in you. Not in a fun way, because I like to be playful and talk smack a bit, but in a really like, oh my God. And you want to say to them, it's a game. It's not your life, right? We had a staff retreat several years ago. And uh, one evening I said, hey, you may want to play some euchre. People said, oh, I love euchre. And I love euchre. Played it since I was a kid. And, and I always play very competitively when I play euchre. And so a buddy of mine who plays euchre a lot was my partner. We had another person who plays a lot. 
who uh, jumped in, but not, not as much as a few others. And then I had a staff member I barely knew, one of our interns, said, uh, she said, I want to play. I said, great. So I was kind of be careful. I didn't know her real well, and so I didn't talk as much smack as I typically did, and I was a little more gentle and kind, and let's play. Well, as we start playing, I find out she's highly competitive, and she is like, oh, gotcha, you could you, nah. And so she starts kind of talking smack. So I talk smack whether I'm winning or losing. That's just kind of how I play the game. And so I start kind of mirroring back to her, and we're having a great time when she was winning. But it became pretty clear that either my partner and I were better, or we were getting better hands, or she had a lousy partner. Whatever it was, she's not just getting mad. She's getting irritated and angry and just all of a sudden she has to walk away from the table. She just can't believe it. And I'm like, do, do I need to apologize? Like, did I say something? No, it wasn't you. You sure? Because I don't want somebody to get mad about a euchre game. And I talked to a couple of her friends. She's like, no, she's always been this way. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I, I still, hey, so sorry. I didn't mean to make you mad. No, it's fine. But I wanted to say it's just a game. This life matters, right? It should be enjoyed. You should produce. You should be competitive. But this isn't your life. It's a game to set you up for your real life. And that changes your perspective. You can still enjoy it. You can still get productive. But your identity is not tied into this game if there really is a larger game to be played. And Paul says, if you don't understand, if you get deceived by that, it's going to lead to corruption in your own thinking and your own habits. Do not be deceived, he says. You'll end up with evil character. Go to the next slide. Evil company that corrupts your good habits. The here and now, this is all there is, the here and now, the here and now, here and now, it's going to corrupt your good habits. You're going to be surrounded with other people. You're like, man, they're productive. Man, they're successful. Wow, they're three rungs up on the, on the ladder. But has that mindset produced great marriages? Bet you some have. Yeah, they got a lot of money and success, but if you look at the wake of their life, it's like second wife, third wife. I've heard you talk about your kids. They don't want to talk to you anymore. See, if you're not careful, that view of time that drives success might corrupt the very things you want and the very things that you see as valuable and the very things you want in your life. So he says, be careful that evil, the force of evil, the, the, the perception that this time is all there is, it can corrupt or corrode or rust out the good habits you have, the good things you want, because you end up sinning, which means missing the mark, what your goals really were, what really mattered. You're going to end up missing out on the knowledge of God. Well, what's the knowledge of God? And here he's applying this to business people. He says, I want you to awake to there's more than the here and now. Awake to that here and now mindset it is corrupting you with, with short-term thinking. And he says the word awake, which literally means the word like resurrect. He's back to the idea of resurrection. Next slide. Awake to righteousness. Wake up that there's a bigger life out there. Wake up that there's more than just a game of life. Wake up that there's more than just that dash between your birth date and your end date. Awake to righteousness. How to have a right standing with God and how to have a right standing with people. As Oscar Wilde found, I found myself stomping all over people. I minimized people over my own pleasure, and I found myself meaningless. As Nietzsche perceived the knowledge of what he was saying was true, is that all of everything would be ultimately meaningless, even a million years, 10 million years from now, when the sun burns out and the universe is gone, nothing would mean anything if his knowledge of the universe was true. But Paul says, when you awake to the idea that Jesus came and showed us, like showed us evidence there is another life and death can be defeated, it gives you a whole different perception of time. I want to wake up to say this life matters, but it also matters as part of a grander scheme. I want to awake to, what does it mean for God in my eternal life to live out and infuse my current life with meaning and purpose? So now I work hard, not because I'm racing to find identity and find purpose, I see the clock as a place to express my identity and express my purpose. And there's sometimes the best thing I can do is spend a day sharpening the axe. What a waste of time! No, I'm actually more productive when I take a day, a week out of the year, to sharpen my axe. Everybody else is just going, 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 chopping, 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 never, 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 never stop, never stop. You end up getting less effective at chopping trees because you have a lot of rusty, dull axes. 
Wake up. Tomorrow's there and then helps you prioritize the time you have. You can still prioritize it well, but without that anxiety that you're supposed to pack it all in in 70 to 90 short years. Here's how C.S. Lewis says it in his book, The Weight of Glory. He says, if God is satisfied with the work, what drives our, our dissatisfaction? Well, if God is satisfied with the work, us and what we do, the work can be satisfied with itself. No amount of pleasure, no amount of, of money, no amount of power is ever going to satisfy you. What you really want is a higher thing, the thing who made you to be pleased with you. Without the knowledge, we are affirmed, patted on the back, and are well known by our creator. We will long and crave vast amounts of unsatisfying quantities of time, fame, work, and productivity. But to be delighted in by your heavenly father has everything to do with satisfaction tomorrow and everything to do with today. Like an art piece wants to be delighted by in by the artist who made it. The deepest longings of our heart are to be known and valued by our maker. We long for beauty. Now listen to this. But more than just seeing a piece of beauty, we want to enter into the transcendence of it. That painting, that piece of art, that beautiful mountainscape, you just don't want to see it. You want to enter into the transcendence of it. You want, you want that significant moment. You want to be part of it. But I can't earn transcendence. I can knock on the door, but it must be opened by transcendence itself. That thing, that purpose, that significance needs to invite me into it. Every day is a moment to move toward what God will and has turned me into a celestial being so significant, so magnificent, that if I met someone like I will become, I'd be tempted to worship it. I've never met a mere mortal. There are no ordinary human beings. Now, there's so much there. But he's saying if you understood what God's offering in your eternal life, what you could be and will be in your full expression of who you were made to be, it is so magnificent. It is so incredible. And you understand that this life is, is a game. It's an important game. It's a real game. It's a preparation game to become everything you're made to be and could be. You start perceiving yourself differently, the people in your life differently. You are receiving opportunities differently. You prioritize the time you have, but you're actually infusing it with a sense that you are satisfied in by your creator. Think about those things, the here and now versus then, then and there. See, if there really is a then and there, then I'm going to maybe prioritize not just the tangible things, but the intangible things, character qualities, intangible things like love and courage and justice. Instead of my life being all about accumulation here and now, it's about fortification, becoming a person fortified with character. Instead of always being only about pleasure, pleasure is one of the great things in life, but it's part of a greater sense of priority as well. And sometimes I have to do unpleasurable things in order to have the untangible character qualities. Instead of always focusing on the immediate, I can focus on the long-lasting, and the long-lasting, which is going to be far more long-lasting than this is short-term. Instead of living for comfort, I can say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to be uncomfortable to become who I'm supposed to be. Instead of focusing on the temporary and thinking more quantities of temporary can somehow fill the eternal hole in my life, I focus on the eternal. I had a chance to really be affirmed in that I have plenty of mistakes and I have plenty of character flaws and I got, you know, a, a list of ways in which I don't live up to my own standards daily. When I was in my 20s, I made a list of character qualities that the Bible affirmed that I felt like God, my artist, wanted in me. And I wrote out, God, I want to cooperate with you in becoming this kind of man. And I took those qualities and I put them against my last name, H-O-V-I-N-D. I want to be humble, the H. I want to be others-centered in what I do. I want to be ambitious. I want to be ambitious um, in accomplishing goals, but I want to be others-focused as I do it. V, I want to be verifiable. I want to catch myself exaggerating. I want to catch myself lying. I want to admit to it as quickly as possible. I want to tell stories that are, that, that are accurate about myself. I want to perceive myself accurately. 
Not perfection, but I want to move toward invisible attributes of being verifiable. Initiate. I don't want to be passive. I want to initiate everything God has for me. How do I initiate in this life? And I want to put in the needs of other people. And I wrote out specifically, I felt the needs of my wife were and each of my kids were. How do I prioritize that and become that kind of person and perceive life through that lens? And D, I want to be dependable. You know, and there's seasons I've done well at that and seasons I've not done well at that. But it's been amazing after 30 years. I, I got this uh, text from a friend of mine, a special needs parent, who's been kind of watching our lives together, Beth and I, over the years. And here's what, and they hadn't talked to me in a while, so they start off with an apology. <laughs> I've been a terrible friend. I own it. I got it. The joy of friendship is knowing that your friend uh, will totally forgive you for having not talked in a while. But number one, I have so much respect for what you do for your son, Quinn. Dads opt out of intimacy it takes to be there for a child who has special needs, but not you. Spouses opt out when their partners need extra love, not you. Pastors wear down when ministry is exhausting, but not you. Friends walk away when people show their sinfulness, not you. I celebrate you, I pray God's abundance on you, and I rejoice in the addition to your house. We just have a pool put in for, for Mr. Quinn. We miss you. I own my silence. I'm getting settled in my new place. I got a lot of character quality working to do. But to think 30 years that other people could observe in me that I've been pursuing this vision God has for me in the midst of that. So here's my question for you. When you think about time, are you trying to squeeze life from a clock? Because you can't. You can't get blood from a rock and you can't get life from a clock. Your life will not be found by more of, higher quality or quantity of. Are you trying to squeeze life from a clock? Secondly, but how could we seize life from the clock? How could I say, the clock does help me measure the things that are important to me? How do I use that as a measurement to make what matters matter? How do I seize opportunity, make the most of every moment I have? But a, a clock is a place I express my life, not a place I get my life. How about this? I'm going to invite the band to come out and tell you this story. Imagine if I set up a bank account for you, and every day I put in $86,000. And every day, if you don't spend it, you lose it. So it only happens for one day. Would that be a very busy day? That would be a very busy day. Whatever else is on my calendar, I would be swamped spending $86,000. And then I'd say, well, the next day it's going to happen again. I'd say it's going to happen for a whole week. You would have a week of probably a lot of panic, but you got to get it all in because you got eight days, seven days, ten days, whatever I give you, of $86,000. Use it or lose it. Right? There'd be this incredible sense of stewardship and ownership that you'd want to do, but there'd also be a sense of franticness. i got to get this while I got it. Well, your clock is 86,000 seconds every single day. And it can create this race against time feel because you only have a little bit of time and you got to use it or lose it, use it or lose it, use it or lose it. What if I told you that bank account is not just here for a day, not just here for a week, but you have $86,000 put in that bank account for your life and for the rest of eternity? You'd still want to manage it well. You'd still want to steward it well. But you'd say, well, if I don't spend it all, there's another 86000 coming tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, and tomorrow, it would take away the desperation. You could take a day and relax because you got 86,000 seconds coming for eternity. That's what Paul's getting at here. With Christianity, you don't just have time. 86,000 seconds, 70 years. You have time after time after time after time. Time just keeps going. And because of that, it can help you manage and prioritize time well now. But without that sense of racing and without that sense of urgency, without that sense of I, I have to be a product of every single second that I have. And the way to find meaning, how to seize life from that clock, is to realize that God, your creator, who wants to delight in you, wants to give you his perspective to know you're forgiven in, 
loved by the God of the universe. Use your time and perception of time to find your maker. Let's listen together. your management of time be different if it was motivated by a sense of satisfaction, not filling a hole of dissatisfaction? I think that's what we're talking about. If I looked at my life as saying, God, I made some mistakes, I haven't kept at your pace, kind of like a dog you're walking is always too far ahead or too far behind, I rarely am at the same pace you are, God but I want to walk the pace that you have for my life. Let's pray together. Maybe you want to say, God, I've been trying to cram it all in. Thinking some quantity or some quality would bring satisfaction. And God, thank you for the good things in my life. 
But forgive me for thinking they could satisfy that hole meant for you. Thanks for dying for all the ways that I've replaced you with things. But not only forgive me, Father, but teach me how to live this life in light of eternity. I want to live the best life without feeling that pressure to fill a hole of dissatisfaction. Teach me, lead me, and guide me. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen. Well, thank you for joining us for Breakthrough Part 2. We really appreciate you being here. We'll, we'll continue our story with, with Murphy for the next few weeks and see what he does. If you're interested, though, in maybe some things in your life that can express uh, ways of impacting and helping other people, um, we have an opportunity as a church. We do this regularly. We go down with a group of uh, families, typically, to, to Happy Church, one of the poorest areas in the whole country in Kentucky. We have an informational meeting coming up. If you or your kids are interested in that, we'd love to have you be part of that. And also, about every few months or so, I do something called the All About Horizon. It's simply a lunch with Chad. And we're going to have that uh, coming up on uh, March 3rd next week if you're interested. There's no agenda. There's no multi-marketing scheme. Uh, There's no uh, sign on the dotted line. It's just a chance to chat, me get to know you, and also ask any questions you want about me, uh, about about the church, about what we do, why we do what we do, why we don't do what we don't do. Um, So if you're interested in that, uh, email us at the office. I'd love to grab lunch with you next week. Um, We'll do that at the atrium. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week.